Hi and welcome back. This is the second part of my series where I go through in detail every single treatment, medication or intervention I've tried in five years of suffering with long COVID. I'm going to talk about the current theory, rationale or science for why each might be effective and then discuss my experience with it before sharing what the anecdotal reports are from others who've tried it and whether it might still be a relevant part of the toolbox today. I'm going to chapter each of these treatments I talk about, so if there's anything you're particularly interested in, you can just skip straight to it. One other quick note on an upcoming live Q&A, which will be on Tuesday the 10th of June at 12pm East Coast time or 5pm UK time. These live Q&As are for members only, who also see these videos three days earlier, so if you're not a member, you might be seeing this after the 10th of June. Um, but if you'd like to join, then there's more information in the description. So back on the subject at hand, I do have to add a big disclaimer up front to say that I am not a doctor, none of this constitutes medical advice, and I am explicitly not recommend anything that I talk about in this video. So please do talk to your doctor before trying anything I talk about here, or indeed anything else. So let's crack on. And first on our list, LDN, or low dose naltrexone. Everyone got quite excited about it a couple of years ago because there was some solid logic for why it might help, and the anecdotal reports that came back from people who tried it were pretty strong too. Naltrexone itself is a drug used for people suffering from alcohol or opioid use disorder, but at very low doses it has, and I quote, anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory properties, potentially calming hyperactivated microglia in the central nervous system that produce pro-inflammatory cytokines causing fatigue. Uh, all the links to what I'm quoting are in the description. There have also been studies showing that LDN can reduce inflammatory markers like IL-6 and TNF-alpha while improving symptoms of fatigue, pain and brain fog in long COVID patients. I tried LDN for a few weeks, titrating up to the upper end of the long COVID dose at about 4 milligrams, and unfortunately I didn't notice anything at all. But perhaps this isn't surprising, because there's a genetic factor to who responds, the OPRM1 gene polymorphism. Uh, what that basically means is that about 75% of the population doesn't respond to the drug as well as the other 25%, who have the right G allele, which responds better. And this does seem to reflect the anecdotal reports from the community, where some people say it's an absolute game changer for them, helping with fatigue, pain, cognitive function and sleep, and others say there was no difference at all. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to know whether you're an A allele or G allele, so if your doctor thinks LDN might help you, uh, then you might just have to suck it and see. Uh, but one in four odds isn't exactly bad in this game, so maybe worth a roll of that dice. Next up, acyclovir, uh, most commonly known as the antiviral you rub onto your lips if you feel a cold sore coming, but you can also take it orally for other viral infections. The logic for its use in long COVID is that it could potentially target herpes virus reactivation like Epstein-Barr or other reactivated latent viruses. We don't know whether it would be any good at dealing with persistent SARS-CoV-2 in tissues though. There are some case reports that show that acyclovir has helped long COVID patients with neurological symptoms and brain fog, as well as reducing antibody titers. I tried acyclovir for four weeks and noticed no change. Um, I've also not noticed much chat in the support groups or the community of others who have tried it and found much success. Whether that's just because not many people have tried it, or because it doesn't do anything, I can't say. So overall, probably not high up on the list of things to talk to your doctor about, unless perhaps you're still testing positive for EBV. Next, metformin. Now, this is normally a diabetes medication, but we have two extremely solid studies which have found that it reduces the chances of developing long COVID after a COVID infection by as much as 53%. How? Well, it's been argued that it has anti-inflammatory properties that suppress chronic inflammatory responses in macrophages, and it may work by inhibiting viral DNA polymerase through phosphorylation. Phosphorylation? Phosphor you, anyway, um, and thus reducing viral replication. Uh, the argument for its use in long COVID rests on a combination of antiviral, anti-inflammatory and metabolic mechanisms that could address multiple aspects 
of the pathophysiology at play. I took metformin for four weeks after testing positive for COVID the third time. This was June last year. Uh, my long COVID symptoms didn't get as much worse as they did after COVID number two, so maybe it helped in that respect, but I can't say that my baseline went up afterwards. Now, obviously, there's many confounding factors here, a COVID infection being the largest of them. And I've not really heard much in the community about people taking metformin outside of a COVID infection and it dramatically helping their long COVID symptoms. So whilst this most certainly is first on the list if you catch COVID again, perhaps don't expect it to cure the long COVID you already have. Next, corticosteroids like prednisolone. Steroids are of course widely known for their immunosuppressive effects. The logic for their use in long COVID would involve trying to dampen down the chronic inflammatory response that seems to be behind so many symptoms. A couple of big buts here though. Uh, Long-term use of steroids is bad, just Google Cushing's syndrome, and obviously suppressing the immune system might not be a good idea if there are persistent or reactivated pathogens. I took a couple of courses of prednisolone back in 2020, starting off at a high dose and tapering down. Uh, they were prescribed to deal with the horrific skin inflammation I was having at the time. They certainly knocked that on the head, and whilst I was taking them, I felt much better, albeit somewhat wired, um, and with corresponding poor sleep. I did feel like I had more energy from this sort of wiredness during the days I was taking the steroids, and that kind of compensated for the lack of sleep. And after I had this sort of high dose tapering down to low dose, subsequently I did try low dosing prednisolone at about two and a half milligrams a day for a couple of weeks. And generally I did feel much better during this period, um, albeit still slightly wired. But as soon as I stopped the course in both scenarios, I crashed pretty hard for another week. So overall, what do I think was going on? Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, the inflammatory symptoms I had had improved whilst taking the prednisolone, um, and I had extra cortisol to keep me going. If you remember Professor Iwasaki's study showing that long haulers have about half the normal level of cortisol. But unfortunately, I was writing spoons my body couldn't cash. And so once I stopped, harsh reality kicked in. And I've heard similar stories from the community. People generally feel better whilst they're on corticosteroids, but fundamentally the drugs aren't addressing the root cause of the condition, they're essentially a sticking plaster with diabolical long-term side effects. So not really a solution or something to put on the list, in my opinion. Next, anticoagulants, and specifically antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel and direct oral anticoagulants like apixaban. They're usually taken as a pair with a third drug um, to manage sort of over acidic stomach, which creates this term called triple therapy. And it's generally taken to address the clotty blood we see in long COVID. The idea is that they may help by improving microcirculation, reducing thrombotic complications, and addressing the abnormal clotting patterns that impair perfusion. That's basically oxygen getting to tissues. According to Dr. Yako Laubscher though, it's not a quick fix and you might need to be prepared to take these anticoagulants for months, adapting your behaviour accordingly to avoid doing anything that might create a bleeding event. Professors Pretorius and Kell followed 24 long haulers taking anticoagulants and found that they reported improvements in their symptoms, although I don't believe that this paper has been published and peer-reviewed just exists in preprint form. So I took this triple therapy, so apixaban, clopidogrel, and famotidine, uh, for two to three months a couple of years ago. I didn't notice any obvious or long-lasting improvements whilst I was taking them, although I did notice that any cuts I had bled a lot more easily. I eventually stopped because I decided I didn't particularly like being on the anticoagulants, and I figured that if I was going to see some improvements, I would have done already. Should I have stuck it out and seen what happened? Maybe. Like so many of these treatments or interventions, the reports generally from the community are a bit mixed. Some people have said it's made a huge difference for them, others say it's made no difference at all. My personal take on it would be that you might want to get some more evidence of hypercoagulation beyond the microclots that most of us have that we can see on the slide, and I ought to just say that some long haulers definitely are in this hypercoagulable states. If you look at my last video where I talk about apheresis, there's a fa fairly horrific picture of a clot. 
Um, so if that's you, then it might be worth discussing this with your doctor. Although, don't expect your NHS GP to be prescribing anticoagulants in a hurry. So next, natokinase and lumbrokinase. These are enzymes that thin the blood and dissolve fibrin, which is what makes clots, or contributes to making clots. Um, the logic and rationale here is exactly the same as it is with the formulated anticoagulants, but these are a slightly more natural approach uh, for which you don't need a prescription. Now I've tried taking them for two to three months in various combinations of one or the other, or both together. But after a ropey few days, which is quite common, supposedly a Herx reaction, um, I couldn't really say for sure that taking natto and lumbro really made any difference for me. And like the anticoagulants, reports from the community are mixed. Again, probably reflecting how much of a problem hypercoagulation is for any specific given individual, where the more they suffer, the more natto and lumbro might be able to deliver benefits. Now, another hot topic of the last year or two, nicotine patches. Uh, the rationale for nicotine in long COVID uh, relating to the interaction between SARS-CoV-2 and the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Acetylcholine receptors? Oh God, who knows? Now, nicotine may help <laughs> by modulating the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, potentially reducing neuroinflammation and addressing dysautonomia symptoms. Some researchers theorise that nicotine could help restore normal neurotransmitter function disrupted by the virus. I've tried them for a few weeks, needing to be careful about removing them by mid-afternoon so that it doesn't interfere with sleep too much. I found that overall they felt a little bit like being on the steroids actually, so I'd get a bit of a boost for the day, but it didn't really feel like it came by healthy means. I felt a little bit wired as opposed to sort of that natural good form of energy. And after continually taking them every day, that boost just kind of merged into the background and I felt like I slipped back to baseline. So I saved them now for crashy days when I know I have to do something to help get me through the day and I need all the help I can get. And obviously I do have to point out that there is a risk in taking nicotine patches for longer periods that you become addicted to the nicotine. So you do have to break up the stints you have taking them with a couple of weeks off every so often. Reports from the community are generally more positive than for some of the interventions on this list. Uh, the improvements generally mentioned are to brain fog and fatigue, with the EDS clinic suggesting that 20% of long haulers see significant improvements and 36% experience moderate relief. Immunologist Dr. Susan Levine told very well that nicotine patches are working wonders for several of her long COVID patients. So this might be something to consider putting on the list. And finally, supplements. Now, obviously this could be a whole series of videos just by itself because the list of supplements that are supposed to help with some or other part of long COVID seems to run into the hundreds, if not thousands. Um, so in the context of this video, I'm going to address this subject a little bit more concisely with somewhat of an overview and my take on supplements generally. Now, if you've ever been online in the age of the internet and long COVID, you'll no doubt have seen someone somewhere saying, I tried supplement X and now I'm 98% better overnight. Um, does that mean that you're going to have exactly the same experience if you take the same supplement? Um, in my experience, this is probably unlikely. Um, my feeling with supplements generally is that if you do manage to plug a deficiency, you will have a dramatic improvement in how you feel. Can you test for every deficiency you might conceivably have? No, but you should certainly get a set of bloods to knock the obvious ones off the inquiries list. So things like vitamin D, B12, iron and folate, etc. And beyond those, it might just be worth supplementing a few of the other obvious contenders like magnesium, zinc, potassium and calcium to see if they make a difference for you. Now, we've also got the fanciest stuff that people talk about with long COVID. Things like alpha-lipoic acid, DHEA, creatine, COQ10, omega-3s, curcumin, selenium, NAC, probiotics, L-glutamine. The list here is almost infinite. Is any of this stuff going to make any difference? Well, all I can say is that none of that stuff really made a difference for me. 
And I think you'd probably need a pretty strong rationale for why the mechanism of any specific supplement would be important for you specifically before you spend hundreds of pounds or dollars filling up your cupboards with this lot. Now, there are two subcategories of supplements left though, which I have found helpful. Um, the first is supplements for sleep. Now, I rely heavily on 10 milligrams of melatonin every night, and I also add 500 milligrams of magnesium glycinate and 500 milligrams of L-tryptophan. And I've genuinely found I sleep better when I take these three together. And the second category here is vitamins. So vitamins C and D are good practice to take anyway at least sometimes, if not every day. And then the other big ones, specifically for long COVID, are the B vitamins. I spoke about B3 niacin early in the pandemic and did some of my own research that showed that long haulers felt significantly better after taking it. Why would this be? Well, <laughs> There's a whole video on this, but basically TLDR, metabolic reasons. Um, I'll link to the video here. Um, we've also just had a proper German trial showing that B3 helped people recover quicker from a COVID infection. Uh, link to that trial in the description. So if you've not tried taking B3 yet, then that might be worth putting on the list. Then the other main one is high dose benfotiamine or vitamin B1. So we're talking a thousand milligrams or so for high dose. Um, when I first started taking it, I felt absolutely brilliant for a few days, and then I sort of slowly slipped back to baseline again. It definitely had some effect, but unfortunately not a long-lasting one for me. Anecdotally speaking, I've also heard lots of people in the community saying they responded particularly well to B1, so that's definitely worth considering. And as for all the mad, expensive, fancy stuff, been there, done that, and quite enjoying no longer having three mouthfuls of supplements to try and swallow every morning. So that's it on my list of everything I've tried uh, for long COVID part two. Coming up in parts three and four, we have this lot. And if you missed part one, that was all this. Of course, if you'd feel comfortable sharing your experiences with anything you've tried, please do add them in the comments and I'll try and get part three out a bit sooner than I got this one out. So as always, look after yourselves, until next time.